welcome to episode 51 of the Energy Balance Podcast, where we teach you how to live without constant hunger and cravings, fatigue, brain fog, poor sleep, and other low energy symptoms by maximizing your cellular energy. I'm Jay Feldman. I'm a health coach and independent health researcher. And joining me again today is my good friend, Mike Fave. Mike and I have been studying health and nutrition together for a long time now. And Mike also draws on his experiences from working within the healthcare industry. Today's episode will be part three of our series on men's hormonal health, where we've been discussing how you can improve men's hormonal health from the bioenergetic view. In part one of this series, we discuss calorie deficiencies, carbohydrate deficiencies, and protein excess, and how these interfere with men's hormonal health. And then part two, we talked about how you can increase testosterone with saturated fats and also how you can decrease estrogen. So if you have not listened to those uh, first two parts of the series, I'd highly recommend you go back and do that before listening to today's episode where we'll be discussing how you can optimize exercise and sleep in order to build muscle. In specific, we'll be talking about the ideal types and amounts of exercise for building muscle and losing fat. We'll also be talking about whether exercise is the primary determinant of body composition and muscle mass. We'll discuss the minimum effective dose of weightlifting to build muscle, why stress and damage are not prerequisites for muscle building, and also some alternatives to weightlifting that will also lead to muscle growth, fat loss, and improvements in hormonal health. And this also includes a movement system called functional patterns that we'll be talking about a little bit. And then lastly, we'll be discussing why having six-pack abs does not necessarily mean that someone is healthy. If you're new to this podcast, then after listening through today's episode, I'd highly recommend you go back and check out episodes one through seven, where we took some time to create a foundation as far as the understanding of bioenergetic health goes. To check out the show notes for today's episode, you can head over to jfeldmanwellness.com slash podcast where you can take a look at the studies and articles and anything else that we discuss or reference throughout today's episode. And if you are dealing with any hormonal imbalances, whether that's showing up as low libido or trouble with getting rid of stubborn body fat or trouble putting on muscle or any issues with the reproductive side of hormonal health, or if you're dealing with any other low energy symptoms, whether that's chronic cravings and hunger, fatigue or chronic pain, or digestive symptoms like bloating or inflammation, or if you're dealing with other symptoms like brain fog or insomnia or poor sleep or any other sorts of low energy symptoms or any chronic health conditions, then head over to jfeldmanwellness.com slash energy where you can sign up for a free energy balance mini course where I'll explain how these different symptoms and conditions really come down to a lack of energy. And I'll also walk you through the main things that you want to do as far as diet and lifestyle are concerned so that you can maximize your cellular energy and resolve these symptoms and conditions. So to sign up for that free energy balance mini course, head over to jfeldmanwellness.com slash energy. And with that, let's get started. So uh, a huge factor when it comes to not only hormonal health, but also some of the effects of hormonal health in terms of body composition is exercise where i mean i guess you could just say it's just another means by which people are trying to improve their body composition definitely trying to put on muscle and a lot of what we talked about already plays a huge role in that so i guess that's probably a good place to start is just i I get so many questions or i've gotten many questions about what type of exercise is ideal for building muscle or losing fat or for some sort of result and the less about particular parameters, like what particular types of exercise, what intensity, how much volume, how long should the you know workouts take, uh, how many days per week, and the there are several factors to consider here. But before we even talk about some of the details as far as types of exercise and everything, I think it's worth mentioning that. The, I mean, I would say that by far the the main factors that are going to drive changes in body composition when it comes to muscle mass and body fat are going to be things like nutrition and which of course is not as simple as just getting, you know, getting enough nutrients as a whole, but everything that we've discussed these last few episodes is going to make a huge impact when it comes to body composition. 
far beyond small tweaks in exercise. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that so often we can get caught up in the minutia of a particular study looking at, you know, a 90% intensity versus 85% or, you know, an extra three sets per workout or something like that. And in reality, those things are going to have a much smaller impact on body composition compared to a lot of what we've already talked about. Yeah. I think a quote that summarizes very well is a quote from Stan Efferding. And it's essentially, I, I'm going to butcher it, but it's along the lines of, if you sleep five hours a night, but you're worried about your creatine intake, you're an effing idiot, idiot. That's essentially what his point of view is. And I mean, if you know who Stan Efferding is, he has a, like, he's, he's, they call him the world's strongest bodybuilder because he's a power lifter bodybuilder. And so his background is like pretty serious in that stuff. But, and he has, he has a dietary strategy called the vertical diet, which actually incorporates Ray Pete's components. And he's mentioned Ray Pete numerous times. And essentially saying that this paradigm is a paradigm that works. So, but the whole, the whole basis behind his vertical diet and his paradigm is being able to recover. And that's something that he focuses on really strongly and making it a priority. And, and all of the elements he talks about are, and besides looking at labs, but also eating enough carbs to recover, making sure you're having enough protein, making sure you're getting enough sleep. So I think the best place to start before we even get to talking about what to do with exercise is you need to be able to recover from that exercise. And that's something that both you and I, I think have had to learn the hard way. Uh, Cause Absolutely. there was, a, there was a period of time where we were just, and we got big and we were both what were we, around 215 pounds, 220 pounds at six foot two. So we had gone to like a pretty big size, but we also started to really beat up on ourselves. And that's when we, I think there's a period of time where we almost broke ourselves from just lifting heavy every single day and not really sleeping and trying to go to class and study and participate in whatever things we were participating in and just like beating ourselves down. So the most important point to hammer home to start is that recovery and being able to recover from your exercise is extremely important. And that's the foundation of everything from there. So we talked about diet first. That's really important. Uh, and the reason why this is so important is because your recovery dictates or your, I guess your overall allostatic load or, or the amount of stress that your body has dictates your hormonal profile to a large extent. And so there's sort of, there's multiple balancing factors involved in that sl stress, sleep, diet, uh, supplements, and then also the, like in, within stress, you have the exercise load. So you want to have everything sort of dialed in if you want the optimal result. It's not just about hammering away at the gym as many sets and reps and increasing as much as possible. The baseline has to be that your hormonal profile is in line first. Yeah. And, and, in talking about our experiences, I, I think another, I mean, at least for me, a, a, something like an experience that highlighted this much more was actually just the first several years that I was lifting where I wanted to put on a lot of muscle and really struggled where I've spent too much time in the gym. You could say doing <laughs> workouts that could have been better, but, but the biggest thing was I was eating nowhere near enough. And I remember being told that I wasn't eating enough and just not believing that that was the case. And, you know, wanting, knowing that I didn't have the eight pack abs that I wanted. So thinking that if I wanted to build muscle, but also have those eight pack abs, I couldn't be eating more than I was. And that was the opposite of the case and eating more helped a ton with being able to put on muscle. And you mentioned when we were getting up to 215, 220, I mean, we would not have been able to get there had we not been eating a lot. We were, we were eating enough there to actually support muscle growth and strength building as yeah. well. That was like, what, like 5,000 calories a day for a, for a while. Like even when we didn't want to eat, eat <laughs> just to put on, and that's not what we're recommending here. I want to make that clear. But it was, that was an important factor that like allowed us to get to where we were. Right. And talking about kind of forcing yourself to eat. I mean, I did have to do that originally, you know, when we're talking, I don't know, it was maybe in high school at the time. I did have to go through a period of that uh, in order to put on some size and, and it helped. I mean, it was one of those things where you get really used to not eating enough and then your, and, and that includes your digestion and, and your metabolism, everything down regulates to, um, 
to adjust to it. So eating more than like, like it took, there was a period where I had to kind of force it a little bit and then that helped. But even, I mean, that was still <laughs> nowhere near. I mean, that was eating like around 2000 calories. That was nowhere near what we were eating later on. Yeah. Anyway. So the point here being that exercise matters and we'll talk about it. Um, but the basically putting on muscle and maintaining muscle are going to be determined largely by our hormonal state, which is impacted by exercise, but is also heavily impacted by all these other factors that we've discussed. So with that in mind, the, as long as we're giving our muscle some sort of stimulation, that's generally enough to build muscle. If those other conditions are, are right or are in the, or in a good place. Especially if you're a beginner, when you're a beginner, you can pretty much go in the gym and not really know much about what you're doing and still make some progress just because the body, like the body is completely de- like not trained at all. So in the, in that situation, you could pretty much do anything. There are minimum effective doses that have been born out of the research as far as volume sets and reps, uh, rest multiple factors along those lines you know how much how much volume per certain types of body parts whether it's larger muscle groups like pecs or lats and we can go into a lot of that stuff and i I just think it's really important to hammer home the point that all the other factors become important first and what your state is 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 first and then you can adjust your training volume and what you're able to do based on the amount of like stress, the load of stress you have going on in your life. And I can like, even for example, for me currently, I have a lot going on currently with work and multiple other things simultaneously that doing workouts that I could have done when I didn't have this going on would currently crush me. Like I wouldn't be able to recover well, you know, like going into the gym and doing, doing the hour workout and lifting heavy and then having hypertrophy sets after and and then trying and then sleeping four nights four hours in the night and then working the next day for 13 hours like i won't recover i'll just basically be beating myself down so you that has to be modulated so as far as if the idea is to maintain a lifestyle and circumstances that allow you to train like that and that's why a lot of build, bodybuilders would tell you it's a lifestyle what they do is a lifestyle you you have to be dialed in your in in other areas of your life if you want to optimize that one area of putting on and building muscle. Now for most people who want to build muscle and who want to look a certain, you know, look good without their, their shirt on, you know, have some, have some biceps, have their chest developed, have some abs, you know, it doesn't take as much work as you might think, especially depending on, depending on where you're coming from. Right. If you have a lot, a lot of weight to lose, like if you're, if you're obese or you have a lot of excess belly fat, that can be difficult to lose, especially with fatty liver and things like that. But for the most part, getting to that point uh, and maintaining it shouldn't be so difficult unless you're coming, depending on your context. So it doesn't need to be the, and I say that because my point being is you don't have to be in the gym six days a week for two hours at a time, just doing a body part a day and slamming back 300 grams of protein. It's, it's, and we've already, we talked about that earlier with diet. So one of the things I want to point out is Charlie Francis, who was a, uh, he was Olympic track coach. He was the trainer of uh, the Olympic sprinter, Ben Johnson. I actually, when I was very into working out and exercise and whatnot, when I was running track in high school, I got a copy of some of his books. I basically purchased them off his website and the basis of his training or his theory focused around recovery. So he had three days of intense workouts that were really intense that forced the adaptation but then also everything around that was built for recovery so he didn't do more and in a lot of other situations you know there's a lot of things that are done with with athletes they're working out multi like two a days type of thing Mm -hmm. so his priority was getting ben very strong and then just training that into his, his speed and sprinting and then whatever the strategy was for running his 100 meter race so and and that's where I started to see the importance of that. And he had this whole regimen of massage and diet and sleep and, and, and days off that was extremely, and then adjusting volume based on, based on what was going on in the different times of the season, right? So if you're in the off season, they, you know, you can ramp volume up, you can work harder. And then when you're in your actual running season, you would, you would peak up to it and you would 
take t- you wouldn't work as hard when you were at your peak when you had to run a race and and that's that ideology is becoming more prevalent now you're starting to see that in, in the powerlifting sphere you're starting to see that in um i mean that's basically where the idea of of uh, periodization comes from is creating blocks or periods of different types of training to allow recovery for different systems and to optimize different systems at different times. So recovery is becoming much more important now, much more focused on just because the hormonal state and the metabolic state and the allostatic load of the body is being focused on as key, as key drivers of muscle growth. So, or even athletic performance. Yeah. And, and another example of that too, which this was just in talking about our experiences similar to yours. I remember finding Dorian Yates, who's a bodybuilder and following his workouts and his, one of his main tenets was just much lower volume. And there were some other factors as well. Uh, but I remember, I remember how relieved I was when doing those workouts and realizing it didn't have to be so uncomfortable to be going through all these workouts uh, for so long, it didn't have to be so grueling. I didn't have to like force failure for every single uh, set I was doing and could still get results from it. So yeah, it was just kind of a parallel, you know, parallel factor here where, where what we're basically getting at is kind of like a volume and intensity versus recovery on one hand, where for so long and, and still in many ways, the emphasis is placed on just working harder, stimulating the muscle more and more, a ton of loading, a ton of stress to the muscle. And we'll talk about that in more detail as well. Uh, and then recovery for a long time wasn't even talked about. And of course now it is, but you, you know, I think in general, the basic idea as far as recovery is just make sure you're getting your protein shake after your workout, you know, it has to be within 30 minutes, which, yeah. uh, in short, I don't think matters quite so much. And I think overall, you know, your overall nutritional status matters way more. Yeah. Not that it, I mean, it still can be helpful to eat after working out, but I'd also say that having some carbs before and after workouts will make a huge difference too. Uh, but yeah, so there's, again, this kind of dichotomy between the exercise intensity and loading and everything versus recovery. And so emphasizing that recovery side, I think is incredibly important and probably matters a lot more than the exact amount of, you know, exactly how intense the exercise is where we can get good results without, uh, without over, stimulation or like over stress or uh, excessive loads excessive yeah. work especially if you're just starting out and i think well, especially then yeah if you're listening to this podcast at this point my assumption would be that most likely you're not listening to us for bodybuilding advice regularly right that that i would guess a lot of people here are more focused on health now there's i'm sure there's people who may have come from a fitness background or bodybuilding sphere that may be listening as well so I'm not precluding anybody but I would, to get started on, I guess, basic terms, so we're all on the same page here, as far as working out, we have volume and we have intensity. Uh, so the three variables are recovery or rest, volume, or I guess recovery, volume, and intensity. Those are the three big ones to look at. And they all have a relationship. So your recovery, we already discussed before. Volume is the amount of sets and reps that are done for a particular body part, at at least if you're coming from the bodybuilding sphere and the idea is to put on muscle, which I think is the context here. You would have the number of sets and reps for a body part per week. And so that can be given as the amount of sets that you want to have for, say, your chest over the course of a week or the total number of reps that you would try and hit for your chest over the course of the week. And you can break it down in different ways and the, the research defines it and looks at it at different ways. Intensity is the amount of weight lifted. Uh, so it's a per, usually a percentage of one rep max. So 90% of your one rep max. If your one rep max is 100 pounds on your bench press, then 90% would be 90 pounds. And then with each percentage, there's a certain number of reps that tends to go with that percentage, right? So if you were going to do three reps, it, I think it's usually like 93% of your one rep max, right? So you would do your 90, you would, if you're doing dumbbells, you don't, you can't break it up as much. So if you had 90 pound dumbbells, if you wanted to do three, your three, your 93% for three reps, you would, you would do the nineties for three reps, right? If your one rep max was a hundred, if your one rep max is a hundred and you want to do three reps, you would do the 90 pound dumbbells three times. 
So based on the percentage of the one rep max, you can you basically get a gauge of what weight would work for you. So with was that clear enough? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. So with volume and intensity, they kind of have a it's not a necessarily an inverse relationship, but the more intense you go, the less volume you technically can handle up to a point. It's not exactly inverse, right? It's just and it makes sense that if you're going to be you can't lift heavy weights for every set all day long. There's only so much that, that your body, particularly your nervous system with the heavy weights can handle because that's usually as far as the theory behind it, the nervous system is what fatigues with heavier weightlifting. And then obviously there's a strain on your joints, like a pretty heavy strain on your joints. So that needs to be kept in mind with hypertrophy training or with a focus more towards volume, uh, the, you can, you get more volume in total, but the weight is lower because you're, you're doing more volume. So they tend to, that that's sort of the crossover, right? So if you want to, and so that doesn't mean that you only choose between hypertrophy or you choose before, uh, uh, for intensity. Basically, there's like a happy medium depending on what you want to do. So with hypertrophy training, the idea of three sets of eight or three sets of 10 or three sets of 12 or those, that's generally the range that has been found for the most part. I mean, there's, there's studies all over the place for that. But like if you wanted to sort of average it out and just get a general idea the idea of three sets of 10 um, is where you would see like for a typical exercise, like bench press would be considered hypertrophy. Whereas if you want to do strength, you could be looking at, depending on your skill level, you could be looking at somewhere from five up to like eight or 10 sets of three to one rep maxes on the bench press. And that really depends on what you're doing and in what phase of, if you're periodizing, which is different blocks or different, different specialized blocks of training over time, you would, you could break it up and, and have different number of sets or anything like that. So it can get, you can get like very in depth with it. Uh, you can go look at periodization. Uh, but the reason I wanted to lay all that out is so that we can have like a basis for discussing some of the volume or in terms of how to set up a workout routine based on some of the research discussion of volume and intensity. Um, just so that there's guidelines, right? They're, they're not hard and fast. They're just guidelines. It's the same thing with looking at the dietary recommendations that we talked about a 0.6 to 0.8 grams of protein or anything like that. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so before we talk about some of those general guidelines, as far as somebody who's working out in the gym, just a couple. So we, we kind of talked about the principles of like how important recovery is. I also wanted to talk about this other you know, talk about muscle building, which is hypertrophy and this concept of mechanical loading versus damage and stress and the different types of hypertrophy. So myofibrillar hypertrophy versus sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. And the reason why this is important is important kind of goes back to what we were discussing earlier, as far as the, the stress not being necessary and what's kind of, you know, the minimum effective type dose for building muscle. And so this, one of the kind of common, you know, some of those common tropes, some of the common ideas as far as muscle building involve, you know, doing sets to failure. So uh, extremely high reps or doing them, you know, doing a, whatever weight you can do for as many reps as your muscles can handle. And that that's, what's going to lead to muscle building or another aspect of that is focusing on the eccentric part of an exercise. So when you're doing an exercise, you have the concentric and eccentric portion. The concentric is when the muscle is shortening. So if you think of a bicep curl, that's when your arm is going up, you're curling the, uh, the dumbbell if, if it's dumbbell. And then the eccentric part is when you're lowering it down. And so a lot of people also talk about emphasizing that eccentric portion in order to increase hypertrophy, increase muscle building. And so they'll talk about, Know, counting how many seconds down you're going and maybe it's two to four seconds down and the problem with well i guess what's kind of being parsed out in the research now is that it seems that these types of exercise or aspects of exercise that create a lot of damage and create a lot of stress do cause hypertrophy but it's a different type of, of hypertrophy which is called sarcoplasmic hypertrophy 
which instead of involving an actual building of protein in the muscle, which is the myofibrillar type of hypertrophy, instead it's basically an increase in, I mean, it's still an increase in, in protein content, but also other like resources in the cells. It's basically improving the muscle's ability to handle stress as opposed to improving its, um, it's necessarily its strength or its ability to create tension. And so sometimes this involves swelling. It can also involve basically increasing the, like some of the nutrient availability um, needed to handle that stress, but it tends not to be the type of hypertrophy that we want to focus on. Whereas instead we want to focus more on the myofibrillar type of hypertrophy, which is basically increasing that contractile muscle uh, which allows for an increase in strength. And so that's going to happen more with a focus on the muscular tension. So how much weight you're lifting, for example, or how frequently you're lifting it, as opposed to trying to create as much stress or damage as possible. And again, this kind of definitely intertwines with the idea of focusing on recovery as, as a huge part of this, but also the idea that it's not necessarily the stress or damage that's required for building muscle. And instead, just the tension alone is enough for enough of a stimulus to build muscle. Yeah. So, and the reason, the reason I tried to parse out the difference between volume and intensity before so that we can basically give the recommendation. Um, and one of the things to keep in mind is with heavy eccentric exercises, I mean, people have gone so far as to overload their eccentric. So essentially add right. weight to an eccentric movement, like, like load up the leg press more than they could actually push against and then slowly lower it down mm -hmm. just to, to just to get that eccentric function. And it does create a lot of muscle damage and it also ma it makes it a lot harder to recover. It, it's a lot more for the body to recover from that because it, it, like there's a lot more damage involved. So uh, basically from with that said, we don't want, we're at least as far as our opinion goes, not in favor of that, of mm -hmm. using heavy amounts of eccentrics uh, and creating massive amount of muscle damage. What we want to do from our perspective is to basically st create a stimulus that induces muscle growth without inducing tons of damage. And this has been, this has been discussed by within the field, within the, the exercise or the fitness industry as the idea that you don't necessarily need to create tons of muscle damage for the muscle to grow or to stimulate muscle growth but you do need to stimulate the muscles. So what does stimulating the muscle look like? What does that look like in objective terms? So as far as the research that I've seen, it looks at about 10 sets per week for the major muscle groups. And that's your chest and your back. Uh, so that'd be pecs, lats, quads, hamstrings, glutes. You can, there's, there's effect from going more than that for some people and some people require less it looks at uh there's like a benefit of having doing it twice hitting those muscle groups twice per week instead of just once per week so breaking those they say you do your chest and back you would do it twice a week instead of having 10 sets of chest on one day you would have five sets of, of chest one day and five sets of chest another day right and the same thing goes for legs and then for the smaller muscle groups they do get hit by by those exercises so i think it was around six sets uh for the smaller muscle groups then your smaller muscle groups is like your biceps your triceps your calves um your abs things like that required i mean your abs could be worked more without necessarily inducing a whole bunch of uh speed fatigue or stimulus on the body but some of the heavier exercises like if you were to squat or if you were to do a heavy leg press or if you were to deadlift or if you were to do heavy bench press, those create more fatigue, not only neurally, but also more fatigue on the tissues themselves, just because you're handling more weight and you're using more muscles at one time. They also tend to stimulate a lot of muscle synthesis than if you were to just go in and do, you know, if your workout was to go in and do cable flies for your chest, it's not the five sets of cable flies is much different than doing five sets of barbell incline bench. So that's something to keep in mind that that stimulus changes it even just even when you look at the loading, right? You could do a lot more with 10 reps as far as weight goes with a barbell incline bench than you could with, with cable flies. So basically that, that was, that's the minimum effective dose shown in some of the research. And 
so just to, to say it again, it's 10 sets per week, a little more, a little less, depending on what your, your situation is. You know, some people recover really well. Some people can put on muscle really well split usually over two workouts. And that's for the larger muscle groups, chest, back, quads, hamstrings, glutes. Then the other smaller muscle groups, which could be your calves, your biceps, your triceps, uh, your shoulders, um, which also do get hit in your pushing and pulling exercises, whether your bench or your row, your shoulders do get worked to some extent there. They are about six sets per week, and you can split those up over two workouts. So you can have a push-pull workout, and then you can have a lower body workout, right? So that's four days out of the seven for working out, or you could break it apart more. The other thing that they're starting to look at now is if you – break apart the workouts and instead of splitting them up into um like push pull over the two days and then so push pull and then legs if you split the workouts up even more and you just did a little bit each day so that you manage to stress a little more right so you're not like killing yourself one day with a heavy push pull and then the next day you go and do legs and then you rest you sort of break that up over the course of the week and this is the other thing that's important here is real life, right? This all depends on what your schedule can handle. If you have two days off a week and that's Saturday and Sunday and the rest of the week you're slam jammed and you can maybe get like one or two workouts in, then I would look to work out three times a week or four times a week, right? But if you say you have the time to work out and split it up every day, you have like 45 minutes after work, you're ready to go and do it, then by all means, you know, that it's up to you work school whatever it is so you have to see what fits into your workout but the most important thing is to look at total volume over the course of the week now with that said what with that total volume what are we looking at as far as uh as far as weight that we're lifting for the hyper hypertrophy or muscle gain the what they're looking at there is um for about i think it was eight to twelve reps and then so you do eight to 12 reps of bench press for three sets in one workout. And then you can do two sets of cable, cable flies for, uh, you can go a little higher. You can go a little higher on the rep range there, maybe 12 to 15 reps. And that's one workout for chest. And then the next workout, you could do decline bench and dips, right? So the, the idea is to stay sort of a, between the eight to 12 and that's for your five sets. But it is in that you don't have to only do one exercise for five sets either, right? You can break it up. So it could be bench and flies, it could be decline bench and dips. Depends on what you want to do, what you're trying to shape, what you're trying to focus on. Um, and then from there, the other thing I would say is you can also build in some strength work into this program. So you can do um, like a five, three, one type of deal where you're doing three sets of five three sets of three and then three sets of one and working on percentages. And so for example, you would be looking at something like your barbell bench press, right? With your barbell bench press one week, you would do three sets of five reps. The next week be three sets of three. And then the final week would be what's it? Five, three, one. So it's not three sets of one. It's five, three, one, you peak. And then you take after that, you would deload, which we'll talk about after. Um, and you could, after you did something like that, you can put in some hypertrophy sets to meet that weekly volume. And that's, I think what people call to some extent power building where you have some power lifting in there. So you're working on strength and you're working on increasing strength, but also have some hypertrophy in there as well. So those are all options to play with. Um, I threw a lot of ideas out there. So, and that's sort of how I've set up my workouts in the past. And I know that's how you set up your workouts in the past, particularly for bodybuilding stuff. So just, something to keep in mind there. And that was something that actually worked for us pretty well because we were increasing strength. So we were able to increase weight on the hypertrophy exercises. And by increasing weight on the hypertrophy exercises while increasing strength, we were able to actually put on a decent amount of muscle mass fast while we were eating enough. Yeah. And we were periodizing too. I mean, we did, we threw some different factors in yeah. there, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, those are all helpful starting points. The, you know, and kind of guidelines. And I think that the 10 sets per major muscle group per week is, is a helpful guideline, especially um, along with that too. I mean, again, just, I guess, kind of recapping some of the main points is focusing on some of those larger muscle groups, not needing to, um, to force excessive amounts of exercise beyond some of these kind of minimum effective doses, 
um, along with this too, is not always needing to go to, fa- to failure. So I know you're talking about intensity earlier and you know the percentage of your one rep max and how that correlates with the maximum number of reps you can do. But you also don't need to be going to failure with each set. Yeah. Well, built into 531, the or the 531 program, because we we've tried out a bunch of powerlifting programs, right? So we we did starting strength to start, and then we moved to 531 after that. Um, and with the 531 program, you the goal was essentially to calculate your one rep max and then use your numbers starting from your 90% of your one rep max so that you were never working with weights close to failure. Mm-hmm. That's true. And so, I mean, along with this too, the, there are a lot of ideas there for structuring your own workout for people who are not familiar with these things and don't want to go to, you know, don't want to create the workout themselves or anything, finding an average workout. I, I, I mean, when it comes to building muscle, if all these other factors are in place, I don't think it matters too much as long as you are focusing on, you know, big muscle groups, major, you know, the mo- complex movements, deadlift, squats, bench press, things like that. That's going to be pull-ups, dips, those are going to be the biggest bang for your buck sort of thing. And so from that perspective, it doesn't, you know, you can pull up many different workouts and get results on a ton of different ones and modify them based on how you're feeling and continue to experiment with some of the things that we've discussed and going from there for, again, for the people who aren't creating their own workouts, which a lot of people are just looking for something to follow. So, you know, whatever it is that they're already doing or looking towards any of the fitness apps, I think is is fine as a, as a starting place. And what I was kind of, what I wanted to transition to talking about as well is just that the most important thing here is getting some sort of relatively intense stimulation on the muscles. And it doesn't, from my perspective, doesn't matter too much, whether you're doing it in the form of weightlifting or, or something else. Weightlifting is just helpful because it's a little more controlled. And so you have more, I mean, you can choose exactly how much stimulation you're getting on each muscle. I mean, that's what it basically is. Were you going to say something? Oh, I was just going to say it's just set up for that, right? right? It's the weights and everything are built and the machines and everything are built so that you can focus on individual muscles. And then basically it's very reductionistic, the entire idea behind it. But you can find out how many sets and reps you need to stimulate the muscle in general and then just sort of work at it from there. So as far as like looking good and building, you know, building a lot of muscle tissue, like by all means, lifting weights and bodybuilding stuff and all the machines are excellent. You have to be careful, right? Like doing really heavy back squats can put it, take a toll on your, on your spine, especially if you're not doing it correctly. So those are always things to look out for as well. Or you can get really hurt benching. if You go too heavy and you don't have somebody to spot you. So those are things to keep in mind or deadlifting will hurt your back. So you have to be, you have to know what you're doing, but that everything was set up for that purpose. Now, as far as like athletic ability and all that type of stuff, do those things help? Yes, but it's like the movements you're training are very reductionistic. They don't fall within to, you know, plane. So it depends on what your goal is. But as far as hormonal stimulus, having a lot of muscle mass and putting it on like that, bodybuilding is one of the best ways to do it. It's just depending on what your goal is. Right. And, and right, exactly. And along with that, there are a lot of alternative things that can be done that will still lead to muscle growth that don't involve, uh, don't have to involve weightlifting. And, and basically what I would say, the important part here is having just some amount of intense muscular stimulation. So pretty much any sport that you do, maybe, I mean, pretty much anyone, of course, something like golf is just an example. Like you're probably not going to be getting enough where you're going to be building a lot of muscle, at least in most areas, maybe, you know, a lot of the forearms and um, like the your obliques. obliques on one side. On one side. <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, You're all yeah. wound up on one side. <laughs> right, exactly. But uh, most intense, you know, most sports which have that intensity component, um, a lot of, you know, quick movements and things are going to, you know, would have enough simulation there to build some muscle. Again, it might not be as much as... as a bodybuilder, yeah. Exactly. But uh, that's not everyone's goal and not everyone is interested in, in weightlifting. Yeah. So the the most important factor here, zooming out from just the weights would just be getting some amount of intense exercise in, I would say at least two times a week, ideally closer to three or four, um, if not even a little bit more, I would say those are, that's going to be really important for building muscle. And again, there's a lot of options there. You can try something new as far as sports go. Yeah. Martial arts. Yeah. Martial arts is always a a great one. And, uh, and that can include boxing, kickboxing and all of that tennis and swimming and, 
I don't know. There's there's a lot of options. basketball, whatever. Yeah, yeah. There's uh, sprinting if you want. One thing I would right. say to stay away from is long distance running. I, if as far as building muscle or having a positive hormonal response, I don't think that that's a good thing. Right. Just and that's just based on the research. I mean, I do have a bias. I hate long distance running. I'll just put it out there. Right. I'm not. I never liked endurance sports or exercise. So take it. Take what you will from that, right? I've only I've been in the gym. I never ran on the treadmill, so well, I I ran a lot for four sports and also well, I guess most of it was four sports. But I taught myself yeah. to to semi like running and even coming from me, I'd say the same thing that I don't think it's too helpful. Again, but long distance running is relative, right? I mean, a mile or two might be fine for most people or some people who are trained for it, but that doesn't mean like running half marathons or marathons is a good idea i I think in general they're probably not going to be uh as opposed to sprints which i know you mentioned which i think are probably a much better idea especially from the this hormonal health perspective right like the whole context of this current podcast is about increasing androgens and things that you can do for that and movement and exercise is is a big one and the reason why bodybuilding is such a big one is because you since it's so reductionistic you have a lot of control over variables and you have a lot of control over how much volume you can do here and there, right? So you can you can make determinations and tweaks very easily. And it also having high androgens tends to go with having a six pack, having a big chest, having built arms, having a like a thick back, all that type of stuff. Like that is a stereotype for oh this this guy's really androgenic. Whether or not I mean in different fields, you know, if you go if you go into Muay Thai or Jiu Jitsu and you're a big bodybuilder and you and you're going in there as far as Muay Thai and Jiu Jitsu, you'll get wrecked for the most part. Right. And this, this goes with, this goes with a training principle. I think it's really important to mention is specificity, right? So whatever you train for specifically is what you're going to be good at. So just because you get big in the gym, doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be good at throwing a punch. And that's because different systems are being trained just because you can squat 400, 500 pounds. Doesn't mean you're going to be a great sprinter. It can help it, Those things can definitely help. But the, the specificity principle is important as well. So if as far as increasing androgens or anything like that, getting into any type, a lot of these exercises, a lot of exercise in general can help, but you have to keep in mind, okay, so say I want to, you know, say I want to increase my testosterone and whatever, I want to lower my cortisol, whatever the whole goal is as far as following the podcast is here, you have to keep in mind, like, how do you want to do that? Do you also want to get good at boxing? Well, then I would focus on boxing. I wouldn't try to think that you're going to get good at boxing by going and getting big in the gym. That would be secondary to go and focusing on boxing. And the stimulus from a lot of these exercises is good in general. I mean, although getting punched in the head or getting your, like <laughs> getting choked out a lot in jujitsu is not a good thing. And I actually have like, I actually had like damage in my neck from doing jujitsu for <laughs> for the, that one, the one year when I was in the past year so i wouldn't say it's necessarily like you have to be careful what you're doing with that as well so just choose wisely on what your exercise choice is and stim- the exercise stimulus in general is, is important yeah so so we have just to clarify like we have this one component of getting some intense exercise in which is worth getting in on you know several times a week and then in addition to that it's well and i guess so b- before we talk about the next component of exercise and movement i do want to also mention that I think functional patterns is it's a, a movement system basically that in like a form of exercise, if you will, that I think is worth looking into for people who want to focus more on being able, able to move well and perform exercises that are built around human movement, as opposed to what you mentioned earlier with weightlifting, where a lot of the, yeah. the movements are based around either stimulating a particular muscle in a particular range of motion for reductionist purposes of just building the size of that muscle or it's built around moving large amounts of weight in certain planes of motion for yeah you could Following say no mile no, go ahead i was just going to say you could say no reason other than the the egotistical boost of being able to lift a lot of weight but you know there's the whole competition aspect of that that's yeah yeah but the uh functional patterns follows to a large extent thomas myers work with myofascial lines which is also like a really interesting concept so i would say functional pa- patterns to some extent is almost like the ray peat of exercise if you want if you want to put it that way just like the way of thinking it has a more integrated holistic sense of thinking but and it really again it all comes down to what your goals are right if you 
want to be a better mover and can you build muscle with functional patterns yeah I'm, I'm sure you can there's there's some guys who who work in the functional pattern or are trained in the functional pattern sphere have a decent amount of muscle mass i mean a lot of them are wrestlers though which is a different story <laughs> but you know there's different contexts there but you can build muscle with that it's just it's i don't think it's going to come on as quick as if you were to start if you hopped on a bodybuilding regimen so we really have to narrow down what your goals are with exercise uh, but the overarching goal i know we keep saying is just that some uh, the stimulus is important itself right so getting some exercise is important in itself and for people who now don't really want to exercise that hard or or are not necessarily interesting in exercising you know hiking uh going for a walk throwing a frisbee around mm -hmm. playing with your dog all just moving in general is very helpful you know getting some time in the sun going for a swim at the beach all of those are exercise you know without necessarily having to be this idea and i think we've talked about this before this idea of like a structured regimented program that is your exercise and that you have to do right it can just be something that you enjoy i know a lot of people it's oh, i'm gonna go play basketball with my friends every friday night at the y <laughs> you know that's that's something that's that's common for a lot of guys just to stay in shape and that's fine as well you know for a lot of people the enjoyment aspect is also really important Absolutely. Some people really don't like working out in the gym. Just is how it is. You know, some people would much rather go play soccer for their boys or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So, so with all that in mind, from the hormonal side, from the body composition side, having some intense exercise on a semi regular, on a pretty regular basis is helpful. As you were mentioning also, uh, it's helpful to have, and, and to emphasize this further, it's also helpful to have movement outside of that structured exercise where we're not sedentary the rest of the week when we're not working out or playing basketball. And the, it, you know, this can be simple things like just making sure you take a walk X number of times per day for 10 minutes or uh, using a treadmill desk or a stand up desk or, you know, where you're sitting and standing or just moving around a little bit more, just placing an emphasis on uh, not being quite so sedentary as we tend to be nowadays, which again, is when it comes to something like exercise, it has been shown that a lot of the benefits health-wise come just from moving, it, just from not being sedentary. You know, even like we can talk about the specifics of body composition uh, changes from weightlifting or intense exercise, and there's value to that. But the, the bigger picture health uh, sort of effects and a lot of the hormonal effects just come about from not being sedentary, just moving throughout the day. And Again, when they're looking at that, that can just be like gardening or cleaning around the house. Just anything that's getting you up and moving is also going to make a huge difference. So definitely want to emphasize that. And, it, and and that can kind of include some of what you mentioned as far as walking a dog or going on a hike, which that can kind of bridge both sides of having some sort of intensity and some sort of um, just basic movement. Yep. Yeah. And again, those, when it comes to intensity, that amount and, and the actual uh, how intense it is is going to vary for everybody as far as what's ideal for them. So, uh, yeah, just some principles that I think are all important to to be keeping in mind there. Yeah, what can you and also what can you handle at that point, right? You want to have your six pack abs and this and that, but you're not able to go to the gym and handle a workout like that. Then I think you'd be shooting yourself in the foot to focus on that goal over your your health at that moment, right? The right. goal would be to get there the goal would be to be able to get there at some point if that's something you really want to do but mm -hmm. it, it takes steps don't sacrifice your health just for that that appearance and I, I think it's important to point out here that a lot of people equate that with health right it being really lean or and I, I know we've talked about this in other episodes it doesn't necessarily mean like while that image is what's presented the the ideals i think are slightly skewed in like our current culture for how women are supposed to look and how men are supposed to look. I mean, for a lot, the amount of work that goes into a lot of those guys gracing the covers of men's health and men's fitness for us, bes besides their actual own work and maybe whatever they might be using, if they are using something, just the amount of editing and lighting mm -hmm. and shading and, and makeup and whatever and pump that they had before they did it. I mean, right. A lot of cases, it's especially nowadays because online it's gone out of control. I mean, steroid use is pretty rampant, 
and without a lot of people disclosing the use and people are looking up to these people and it's like you know if you take a bunch of steroids it's kind of easy to get away with with more right because it's like having a high hormonal testosterone or high androgenic profile regardless of what you do you know right. you could not sleep but your testosterone is still going to be elevated you're still going to signal anabolism so those are things some of those things like they really do make a difference and that's directly altering the hormonal profile and i mean if that's what you want to do by all means that's your choice but there are risks with that our goal here right. is to alter the hormonal profile indirectly through lifestyle means exactly and and Again, I think that's important to recognize how much changing hormones can affect body composition and muscle mass as, you know, obviously people understand that when they're taking something exogenously, but in the same way, anything you're doing as far as nutrition or sleep as we'll talk about or anything else is going to affect your hormonal state. And just to clarify, of course, this is starting on that energetic level and the hormones are just representative of that, uh, but it kind of signals of that. But uh, yeah, so, so that's going to make a huge difference. Another thing as well, that's important to point out when you're looking at whoever's on the cover of whatever magazine or whoever's on Instagram is that fitness does not equal health and six pack doesn't equal health. And so many of the people who are in those states are dealing with a ton of different health issues. Yeah. I know both of us know people who, you know, some, some, you know, somewhat personal, I know look amazing. personally. Yeah. Yeah. They look amazing, but they have some like serious symptoms going on, whether it's right. bloating, gut issues, uh, menstrual issues, mood disorders, you know, yeah. it's people, people, I think, I think it's important to realize that people's bodies have tendencies to break down or deal with stress in different ways. Right. So somebody could look absolutely amazing. And I've seen this in the hospital. I've seen, I've had patients that look absolutely amazing. And then you get their medical history and you're like, wow. And it's just, it, it's like, I can't believe you have all this going on. Like you look great. And I, it's just that it, it's just people, his bodies handle it differently. Their predispositions are different. Right. So it's just something to keep in mind that, you know, we don't always know what's going on with somebody else. We don't know what their context is. And it's kind of hard to take somebody's context and how they look and what's going on with them and graft it onto yours and think that you'll have the same results that, that they will, if you do what they do. I know that's already, that's an implication for a lot of people. And I think that gets a lot of people in trouble is, oh, if I do, if I do this or I do that because this so-and-so does it and they look that way, then I, I will automatically look that way as well, or I'll be healthy as well. And they don't know what else is going on with that person. So right. just something to keep in mind that we don't know everyone's, con and it's more eye opening once you start, like when you start to work with people like that, who look the way that they look or do what they do and they, they still have. The issue going on <laughs> they're just manifesting it differently yeah and and along with that too is when you have this conception of that being your goal and the assumption that that also means good health it's important to note that improving body composition takes time even if you're doing it in very unhealthy ways you know it takes a long time to uh, put on or can depending on where someone's coming from it can take some time to to drop body fat and put on muscle uh but this is especially going to be the case if you're doing it in a way that tends to be supportive of your health. And what I mean there, I guess, again, this isn't, I shouldn't necessarily say it like that because it all, it really does depend on where you're coming from. If you're, if you're coming from a decent place and you're, and metabolically you're doing well, you might be able to put on muscle and drop fat easily. But for somebody who's coming from a place that's much farther from that, they might be tempted to over, you know, to over exercise and under eat and, Cardio is a huge part of this. I know we talked a little bit about long distance running, but a huge part of something I hear about all the time is fasted cardio as a quick way to lose fat or as a way to help lose more body fat. And these sorts of things are will help with body composition in the short term, but in the long term, they end up really degrading our health and disrupting our hormones pretty considerably and leading to a ton of other symptoms and problems. And so we just want to keep that in mind when. A, when we're seeing these, these, you know, models as our goal, like remembering, as you were saying, or as we were talking about that, that doesn't always mean that they're healthy, but instead wanting to improve our body composition with health in mind and wanting to make sure that we're doing the things that are supportive of our health rather than try doing, you know, stressing ourselves out physiologically 
in order to lose uh, body fat, which again may work in the well, may and typically does work in the short term, but long term comes at at a cost. Yeah, what's the cost? What are you trading for? What what you're doing? I think that's always what's the risk versus the reward, right? I think that's really important to look at in pretty much any situation. Yeah. And this is, I mean, just to clarify too, this isn't even just risk. This is like a direct transaction. You know, it's... Well, it's a trade. Yeah, it's a trade. Yeah. 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 So along with this, you know, talking about this transaction between stress versus, basically talking about stress versus health and uh, how we want to be doing things that are supporting us hormonally and supporting us with body composition, but uh, doing it in a way that's supportive metabolically and that's not coming at this major cost of stress. Uh, another huge factor here is sleep. And this is, this is as you mentioned that, that quote earlier uh, from Stan Efferding about how important sleep is, there's, there's a lot to be said for how important sleep is for our hormonal health, for body composition, for pretty much anything. And it's, it's funny because that, that's a perfect example of that transaction that a lot of people are making where they're trading in sleep for the opportunity to stress themselves out with excessive exercise where instead yeah. of sleeping for you know six or seven hours which it already should be more than that they cut it down to four or five so that they can get their cardio in in the morning or full workout in, in the morning whatever yeah. it is and yeah in reality that's going to be hurt, harming you at least in the long run a lot more than it's helping you and even in the short term it makes it a lot harder to improve body composition than uh, if you're actually sleeping enough and so i'd we had referenced, we did a, an episode talking about sleep before. So I will reference that. And, and there was a couple of studies that we talked about in that episode. One that was showing that uh, they were looking at two groups, one that averaged five and a half hours of sleep per night and one that averaged eight and a half. And the ones that uh, averaged five and a half had less fat loss. They had 55% less fat loss and they had increased the loss of fat-free mass, so muscle, bone, whatever, by 60% compared to the group that had slept more. So that's, I mean, that's, those are large percentages there. Yeah, those are huge numbers. Yeah, just from a difference of three hours of sleep. And that's five and a half to eight and a half. So for people who are maybe on six hours of sleep and feeling like they're fine with it, you know, it might be worth yeah. considering, you know, adjusting those priorities and recognizing that that might be something that's really holding you back. Or taking your current priorities into consideration, right? If you want to look right, a right. certain way and you want to perform a certain way, you need to sleep, right? Yeah. So getting that extra three hours may actually increase your productivity and you will gain those three hours back during the day instead of staying up late. Although to be fair, I think both, well, sometimes life just gets in the way. Right. And yeah. I think both you and I, like we know the benefits and we know the problems of not getting sleep. We've both read the research and sometimes just the situations of life. I mean, we get it. There's, there's times where I can only get four hours with what's going on between school and, and work and whatever else is going on, like managing everything. It's just like, yeah, I have to assignment. There's this essay I have to hand in and it's due by 12 and needs to be done. And then I have to go to work tomorrow, wake up at five. So like, it's not good. You definitely feel it definitely beats down on you. But sometimes, I mean, it just, sometimes it just is what it is. Ideally, the preference would be getting like, you know, at least seven, eight, nine hours of sleep you know, and then try and make it up the days later on. It's like, Oh, I got, I got 11 hours that day. I'll be all right. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, I, I agree. I've gone through periods similar to that. I mean, I've gone through periods where I've either not emphasized my sleep as, as much, or just been, as you mentioned in situations where it was, you know, it, it fell lower down in priorities, however, however you want to put it. Uh, but having good consistent sleep, I would say is one of the, one of like the main pillars of, of health and yeah. one of the main factors that, um, that contributes to the way I feel day to day. I mean, it's, it's massive. Yeah. yeah. It definitely beats down on you too over time. Yeah. And we've talked about this before where a lot, like a lot of people will say, Oh, I can get by on that. And, you know, I've gone to that place too, where I was, when I was working night shift and I was some nights I would sleep like one hour and then I would work, sleep an hour and then go back to work. And I'll tell you, you're like, aren't you crushed? And I was like, no, I'm fine. And it's sort of just like your body gets a new set point. But when yeah. I finally got off nights after what was it, one and a half years, and I was able to like sleep again, just I was like, wow, I feel so different. I, you know, I literally, and I think that's probably night shift is probably like one of the worst 
and I'm not, I'm not picking on anyone at nights. I work nights, uh, but night shift is probably one of the worst things you can do for yourself. Sleep wise. It's so difficult to get good sleep and you're yeah. constantly just like, at least for me, I was, even though my schedule was dialed in, I was still having a real higher time of sleep. And when that sun, when the sun just comes out, you just want to be outside. <laughs> you want to, you want to see the sun. So that always made it hard, but yeah. I think overall, like you, you, the body gets into a new set point and you can, you can, you don't feel the drop in performance or the, or the, you don't feel as much to decrease in, in feeling good or the new symptoms that come up, like this sort of just slowly crop up on you. And then you don't know, then you're like, Oh, what's going on? And you, you, you can think back, you can take some like stock of your situation and be like, wow, I've, <laughs> I haven't been sleeping for a couple of days now. And it's like, yeah, I just, I need to, reprioritize myself at least that's something that 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 i've done yeah i was gonna say i hope that most people listening aren't quite that far in hopefully for them it's like oh i just got six hours for a couple of nights instead of eight yeah but yeah and it and it definitely is one of those things with that kind of set point and a lot of times you don't realize it until you go back so maybe for a while you're sleeping only five hours a night then you start sleeping eight hours a night and you, you maybe notice some differences but then if you were to go back and only be able to sleep for five hours one night, you notice that you notice that effect yeah. for sure. You wake up like, like somebody smacked you just like, <laughs> yeah. And, and all with all this in mind, I know a lot of people have trouble falling asleep and staying asleep. And a lot of what we talked about in these earlier episodes will make a huge difference, whether that's not overtraining or making sure you're eating enough or getting enough carbs or getting enough fat. Those are, I would say, Probably the most getting, important things. Being exposed to sunlight is but, really yeah. important with that as well, especially for setting circadian rhythm. Like if in my experience, at least sitting inside all day long under the fluorescent lights is one of the worst things I can do for my sleep, especially. If, and, you know, this is again, this isn't picking on anybody, but in days where I've had the train, my, my trainings for orientation and I've had to sit there for the whole week nine to five just going through powerpoints under the fluorescent lights they're like three feet over my head and i'm just like wow this is absolutely terrible and i have a hard time sleeping just just because of the environment you're not moving you're sluggish you have no access to good light you're in this usually the environment at least in the hospital is pretty sterile and cold so they have the air conditioner on all year round <laughs> i don't know they always manage to keep it at like 50 degrees in there but <laughs> Yeah. So I, yeah. the sunlight imp- part, I think is really important, um, for setting yeah. circadian rhythm and for improving sleep. Um, yeah. and then the other thing I want to point out here, and this is tailing around back into exercise. I don't think it's a good idea to go and try and do a full workout after you only slept four hours. I think you're, you're digging yourself, especially if you know that you won't be able to sleep the, the as many hours as you need the next night. And I say this from personal experience, where I slept four hours, I worked the, that day, and then I tried to go do an arm workout, and then I only slept four hours and went to work the next day. Not a, it's not a good thing. It, it, just, it actually just beats you down, right? So I, I would say that avoiding things like that is important. I think the sleep overall is more important than making sure that you, your biceps and your triceps are hit on the per- perfect program that you that you wrote out. And I'm all I'm saying this all from experience. <laughs> Um, I think pri- I think the top priorities I would say would probably be making sure that your sleep's in order, making sure that your diet's in order, and making sure that you can get at some access to sunlight at some point, or at, and or manage your stress to some extent. So be able to have that time to unwind. I think that's also a really important one for a lot of people, and I also think that's a really important one for helping people sleep because I. And that's, again, that's personal. I come home after however long my shift is, 13, 14, 15 hours, and I can't sleep because I'm wired right. just from going, going, going. So I think having that time to just sit down, unwind, even if it's 30 minutes, just even if you can just close your eyes and just focus on your breath for a little while, I think that's extremely helpful in bringing down that the excitement or the overstimulation or whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I, I will say also, we talked through a lot of other possibilities, details, supplements you can try if you are having trouble sleeping, just other other ideas uh, in those previous sleep episodes. So I'll link to those. But maybe for people who are even on a, <laughs> just to summarize some of the more important points we just discussed for people who are maybe on a more normal schedule, they aren't concerned about night shift or 
uh, I, don't, I don't know, like 14 hour shifts. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just, you, you know, I would say some of the basics would involve some sort of movement daily, at least eight hours of sleep, ideally. Uh, I mean, I shouldn't even say ideally. Eight, eight hours of sleep, I would say, should be really more on the minimum side, uh, maybe even more for, for a considerable amount of people. And so, uh, yeah, and then some, some movement daily, some structured movement, again, ideally a couple times per week or more. Again, as you mentioned, depending on how you're feeling, depending on where other aspects of your lifestyle are at, depending on how well you're recovering, which is huge. And we, we talked about the importance of recovery, but it's also worth mentioning that if you're fe- – you shouldn't leave the gym feeling like you had let like feeling low energy and fatigue. If you came in feeling good, uh, you, you should still feel like you have, you know, some energy, some pep in your step when you're leaving, you shouldn't feel exhausted the rest of the day. You shouldn't feel exhausted the next day. If those things are happening, those are signs of overtraining. Another thing too, is if you're, and this applies to the gym or sports or anything, I'm just saying gym. Uh, but if you're not excited about the exercise that you're going to be doing, then that can also be a sign of overtraining or just a sign that you might want to try some other forms of, of exercise and try to find something you like. I know you talked about that just being really helpful from the stress side and, and just because there's a lot of value in that sort of psychological or mental stimulation. But uh, it's also helpful for being able to do something like helping with consistency where a lot of times, uh, you know, people fall off after doing something for a while and it, it might be because they're just forcing themselves to run or to lift weights when that's not what they want to do. If it's taking an excessive amount of willpower to do what you have to do, then it's time to reconsider what you're doing. Unless you're really, unless you're really trying to reach some type of elite level with what's going on. Right. If you want to, if you want to step on stage as a bodybuilder that requires extreme discipline and willpower, even if you're using drugs, even if you're using steroids, just because to get in that level of physique isn't, is, kind of insane and there's definitely sacrifices that need to be made even health wise now if you just want to look good when you go to the beach and have you know be lean and whatnot you know it shouldn't necessarily be such a grind now as far as enjoying what you do when you go to the gym if everybody only focused on what they'd enjoyed then nobody would do leg day <laughs> <laughs> that might be true yeah I'm just, I'm just, jo- I'm just teasing. I'm just joking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I just mean more like the experience of being at the gym and working out being yeah. something. Yeah. You don't have, to, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I liked working out legs, uh, but I'm, I'm partly joking. I, I mean, know, I, I know. sometimes I really like, if I know I have to work the next day, I don't want to do legs. Cause I know I'm going to be a little tired. Yeah. So, but that's also a good example of what we're talking about. Right. So. Right. Yeah. And, and again, we haven't talked about stress yet and, and we'll get into it, but the exercise is also a an opportunity to get rid of excess stress. It's an opportunity to have some social interaction, uh, and those that kind of all goes with enjoying it. And those things have a massive effect on on everything, all the way down to body composition. Uh, yeah, yeah. All right, that's going to wrap up part three of this series discussing men's hormonal health. In part four of this series, we'll be discussing how you can lower stress and the relationship between stress and hormonal health. And then we'll also discuss the best supplements for men's hormonal health and also the supplements that would better be avoided. So make sure to tune in for that episode. If you did enjoy today's episode, please leave a like or a comment if you're watching on YouTube. And if you're listening elsewhere and could leave a five-star rating on iTunes or a review All of those things do a lot to help support the podcast and are very much appreciated. To check out the show notes from today's episode, you can head over to jfeldmanwellness.com slash podcast. You can take a look at the studies, articles, and anything else that we referenced throughout today's episode. And if you are dealing with any of the hormonal symptoms that we discussed throughout today's episode, whether that is trouble building muscle or trouble getting rid of stubborn body fat or any other hormonal imbalances, That could be leading to a lack of libido or trouble with other aspects of reproductive health. Or if you're dealing with any other low energy symptoms, whether that's chronic cravings and hunger, fatigue, uh, brain fog, joint pain, or other forms of chronic pain, any digestive symptoms like bloating or inflammation, or a lack of sleep as we discussed today, whether that's insomnia or just not getting very deep sleep, or if you're dealing with any other low energy symptoms or chronic health conditions, 
then head over to jfeldmanwellness.com slash energy where you can sign up for a free energy balance mini course where I'll explain how these different symptoms and conditions can be tied back to a lack of energy and also what you can do about it using diet and lifestyle to maximize your cellular energy. So to sign up for that free energy balance mini course, head over to jfeldmanwellness.com energy. And with that, I'll see you in the next episode.